Okay, welcome to Word Without Walls. Welcome to the Tuesday night sunlight service. This is a new this is a Covenant God part two. And we're continuing to look at the, the new covenant, or rather uh, Jesus' blood, which is the covenant, which makes God not a God who is uh, beholden to a covenant, but God who is the covenant. And tonight we're going to really kind of compare and contrast the old and the new. And my key verse for tonight, I'm going to read it in three different versions, but I'm going to sprinkle it kind of throughout the message tonight, is Romans chapter 8, verse 2. And in the King James Version it reads, For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. And I think this is very, very important to understand because we know that you know, we are not under the law, but we are under grace. But just because we're not under the law, that does not make us lawless. What that has really done is that has elevated us to a, a new law, which again is the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. Or as James puts it in his, uh, in his book of the Bible, the, the perfect law of liberty. It's a law of freedom, not a law of bondage. It's a law of life not a law of sin and death. So that's really what we're going to kind of compare and contrast tonight, and we're going to see uh, kind of the shift that happened and kind of how it happened and, and really look at the difference between the, the, the law of Moses, the law of sin and death, and the perfect law of liberty, or the, the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. So my first passage tonight starts in Hebrews chapter 6, and I'm going to read the last verse in, in that chapter, verse 20, and then we're going to move into Hebrews chapter 7. So Hebrews chapter 6, verse 20 says, Whither the forerunner is for us entered, even Jesus, made and high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. So right off the bat, what we see is, and really what we're going to, a big part of what tonight is all about is, is contrasting the two priesthoods, contrasting the two laws, the law of Moses, the law of sin and death, with the Levitical priesthood, kind of uh, uh, versus the the law of uh, the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus, or the Melchizedek priesthood, which is is where we are now. The Levitical priesthood was the, the again the priesthood that was connected to the law of Moses. It was not supposed to last forever. It was only supposed to last as far as the law lasted, and the law was only supposed to last far enough to bring you to Christ. So, so again, we're not, we're not trying to pull the old into the new. We're seeing that the old covenant ended on the cross. It was obsolete. It was fulfilled. It was nailed to the tree. It was absolutely, completely accomplished, finished, and done away with. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And the new, which again, really, it is, is the first is not the Levitical priesthood anymore, but, but it's, it's the Melchizedek priesthood. Which, which again, the Melchizedek priesthood, as, as Hebrews 7 is about to show us, that was before the law anyway. So, so we really have this idea of the law of Moses came first, but really it didn't. Like last week we saw, you know, the Old Covenant. There were covenants made before what we think of as the Old Covenant. There were more covenants before the covenant that, that was attached to the law that was given to Moses. There was the, the, the covenant that God made with Noah, the original covenant, which was, you know, I'm going to wash the world clean, but you're going to be in the ark, which, which again is, is, has been God's plan right from the jump, was to, to put you in the ark, or to put you in Christ by putting Christ in you. And then we saw many other covenants, which we're going to look at in days, you know, in weeks to come. But again, it's this whole idea that, that the old covenant came first and the new covenant came second isn't really exactly accurate. The, the Levitical priesthood came after the Melchizedek priesthood. So, so really on the cross, what God was doing is He was restoring things. He wasn't, he wasn't necessarily making things new, but He was bringing things back to their, their original form or, or back to their you know, original purpose and, and their original plan. So Hebrews chapter 7, starting with verse 1, it says, For this Melchizedek, again, you know, still talking about Jesus, still talking about our, our true real high priest, for this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him, to whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all, 
first being by interpretation King of Righteousness, and after that also King of Salem, which is King of Peace, without father, without mother, without descent, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like unto the Son of God, abideth a priest continually. So, so again, what we see here is, the Melchizedek priesthood was, it, 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 it's what started and it's what remained, but then kind of almost in the middle got put in the Levitical priesthood because we really couldn't understand this Melchizedek priesthood. We really couldn't understand the king of Salem and, and the king of peace, you know, the king of righteousness and the king of peace because to us, righteousness at that time before the cross, to us, righteousness was what we could do for ourselves, what we could get for ourselves. Our only true understanding of righteousness was self-righteousness. And then God went ahead and He defined that for us when He gave us the law. He said, if you were to do this, this, and this, then you would have that self-righteousness. But again, His plan was always higher. His plan was always not a law of sin and death, but, but a law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus. So when we're talking about a new covenant, when we're talking about a covenant God, we have to understand that the only uh, mediator of that covenant, the only high priest of that covenant, the only one who could bring us into that covenant, the only one who could sustain us in that covenant, is Jesus himself. He is the covenant, and he is the high priest of that covenant. In the same way that, you know, Jesus laid down his life in, in, in order to give us his life, but then when he rose back up, he, he rose back up with that life. So, so not only did he give it to us, but he lives it in us and through us. We are never, you know, just hanging out in the wind and, and, and hoping that, that God will swoop in and save us. He, are, he already did that in a manner of speaking on the cross. Now, now he has done everything and, and in us he is still continually doing everything. It's, you know, it's the power of God that, that works in us both to will and to do of his good pleasure. It's all about Jesus. He is the covenant and he is, again, the high priest of that covenant. He is the Melchizedek priesthood. And, and, and again, you know, that, that preceded the law of Moses, that, that went all the way back to Abraham, you know, the father of the faith. So, so again, we're seeing God's eternal plan rather than, you know, kind of a step one, step two, but it, but it was how, how God always wanted things. And then it was what he gave us because of, of the hardness of our hearts, because of, you know, what, what made sense to a carnal mind. He, then he gave us that old covenant so, so that we could see how miserably we failed when it was on our shoulders. And then he came in again, you know, at the appointed time at the cross when he gave us his son. And Jesus said, listen, you don't have to do it. I'm here to do it for you. And I'm here to do it as you. And, and, you know, again, Jesus, he said, if you're tired, if you're worn out, if you're burned out on religion, come and learn of me. He said, I will give you a rest. I will show you how to live a, a, a truly live a life of rest because he was giving us our life. He's living his life in us and through us. So in verse 4 it goes on and says, Now consider how great this man was, unto whom even the patriarch Abraham gave the tenth of the spoils. And verily, they that are of the sons of Levi, who receive the office of the priesthood, have a commandment to take tithes of the people according to the law that is of the brethren, though they come out of the loins of Abraham. So we see here kind of, kind of a stark contrast between that perfect law of liberty, which, which Abraham, Abraham gave the tithes, versus the law of sin and death, the Levitical priesthood, who had a commandment to take tithes. And there's a big difference between somebody giving you something or you taking something from them. There's a big, you know, there's a big heart difference. There's a difference between, you know, being generous or, or saying, well, I have to do this or else God's going to get mad at me, so I guess I'll do it. There's a big difference in the heart. There's a big difference, again, in the covenant. There's a big difference in the nature of what we're speaking of. So it goes on in verse 6 and it says, But he whose descent is not counted from them received tithes of Abraham and blessed him that had the promises. And without all contradiction, the less is blessed of the better. But here men that die receive tithes, but there he receiveth them, of whom it is witnessed that he liveth. And as I may so say, Levi also, who receiveth tithes, paid tithes in Abraham. For he was yet in the loins of his father when Melchizedek met him. So again, he's saying, you know, from the beginning, this was all about 
receiving things. This was all about having a heart that would give. It wasn't about having a commandment to take. He's saying, even Levi, who came from Abraham, in a manner of speaking, he tithed to Melchizedek because Abraham tithed to Melchizedek. He's saying the natural order of things is between God and man, not between man and man to get to God. That was never God's original intent. That was never God's original plan. In the, uh, many times in the Old Testament, you know, especially with Abraham, God would just show up and he would just talk to him. And, and, and he had these like face-to-face, -face, you know, he considered Abraham his friend. And, and he had that relationship with him. And then when Moses came on the scene and when, when the people really had those, those hard hearts, that's when God needed someone to mediate between him and the people. When God called the people up to the mountain, and the people told Moses, they said, we don't want to go up to the mountain. You go up to the mountain. You see what God has to say, and you come back and tell us. Then God had to kind of shift how he dealt with us, because you know you know, God always meets you right where you're at. If you're afraid to come to him, he'll send somebody to you. He's, he's not worried about that. He's not afraid about doing that. But at the same time, he's always had a more excellent way. He's always had a more excellent plan, where again, what we saw with Melchizedek was Melchizedek came right to Abraham. So again, you know, it, 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 it's not about how do we get to God. It's always been about God trying to get to us. And most of the time we were hiding from his presence or, or, or running away from him, him because we thought he was mad at us anyway. But he never gave up on us. He always pursued us. You know, again, as we see in, in, in books like, you know, Song of Solomon, where, where we see that he pursues us and he woos us and, and he loves us and loves us and loves us until we finally, you know, come to the place where we can give in to that love. And that's what the cross was. The cross was the greatest expression of God's love in that He died for us when we were sinners. He gave us everything, even when we didn't believe, even when we didn't want it, even when we rejected Him and, and, and were willing to kill Him just because, you know, because He didn't fit into our carnal mindset. He said, that's okay. Because when I die, your carnal mindset's going to die, and I'm going to give you the mind of Christ. I'm going to bring you out of bondage, and I'm going to bring you into freedom. I'm going to bring you out of the slavery of Egypt, so to speak, and I'm going to bring you into the promised land. I'm going to do this for you, and I'm going to do this as you. I'm going to take care of you because you are my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Even though you don't know who you are, God knows who you are, and he's always there just to lead you and to guide you into that revelation of your identity into that revelation of himself. So, verse 11 goes on in Hebrews chapter 7 and says, If therefore perfection were by the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, what further need was there that another priest should rise after the order of Melchizedek and not be called after the order of Aaron? And here's where I wanted to get to, verse 12. It says, For the priesthood being changed, there is made of necessity a change also of the law. And again, that's what we're looking at. That's what Romans chapter 8 verse 2 says. There was the law of sin and death under the Levitical priesthood, under that economy. But now, because it has changed, now there's a new uh, priesthood, the Melchizedek priesthood, which again is the original priesthood. And now there's a new law the perfect law of liberty, or, or again, this, the, the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. So what we're seeing here is we're seeing a total and complete shift back to God's original plan. He almost had this, this, uh, this parenthetical, you know, quote-unquote, old covenant, which was for the people for a time to get us ready, to get us to understand that, man, we need a Savior. Man, I can't do this on my own. I can't follow the, uh, these external rules. I can't modify my behavior. I can't clean up this old man. I can't do enough to be accepted. Every time I try to do enough, it's always one thing I lack. It's always just out of my reach. It's it, Again, it's like that carrot on the stick where you're so close, but the, the stick keeps moving a little further. There's always one more hoop to jump through. There's always one more thing I have to do to please God. That's how we thought it was in the Old Covenant, in the Old Testament, without the Holy Spirit, with our carnal mind. That's That That was the Levitical priesthood who, who, who you know, put commandments on us and, and, and took tithes from us and, and, and really made us jump through those hoops. But that's not how it is any longer under the Melchizedek priesthood, under the Jesus priesthood. So, so again, verse 12, 
For the priesthood being changed, there is made of necessity a change also of the law. So let's look at this in the Message Bible. Hebrews chapter 7, starting with verse 1. It says, Melchizedek was king of Salem and priest of the highest God. Which again, if, if, if you know about the, the culture back in that time, you weren't both a king and a priest at that time. There, there were kings and there were priests, and, and many times they worked together. The, the priest was more of an advisor to the king. But, but for this Melchizedek to be a king and a priest, that's Jesus. That's who Jesus is. And again, when we come into the New Covenant again, we see it many times in the New Covenant, that that's who we are. We have been made a, a, you know, a royal nation. We have been made kings and priests to rule and reign on this earth. We now occupy this same Melchizedek priesthood because the Melchizedek priest... Jesus occupies us. He lives in us, ruling and reigning. He rules in, in, in us, you know, uh, uh, filling both offices, as it were, uh, of king and priest in us. So that's why we are kings and priests, because the, the king priest lives in us. You know, the same way that, that he is the light of the world and we are the light of the world, it's the same light. It's just now it, it, it's, it's shining in us and it's shining out of us. So it says, He met Abraham, who was returning from the royal massacre, and gave him his blessing. Abraham, in turn, gave him a tenth of the spoils. Melchizedek means king of righteousness. Salem means peace. So he is also king of peace. Melchizedek towers out of the past, without record of family ties, no account of beginning or end. In this way, he is like the Son of God, one huge priestly presence dominating the landscape always. So again, God's plan was always this Melchizedek priesthood. God's plan was always Jesus. Jesus said, I'm the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. And, and you know, really, he, he's everything in between. That was always God's plan. But again, it was the hardness of our hearts that, that God, you know, he, 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 he allowed us to have this Levitical priesthood. He allowed us to have this law of sin and death. He allowed us to have this Mosaic law that, that we could understand, that we could relate to, that we could say, okay, this makes sense. If I do good, I'll be rewarded. If I do bad, I'll be punished. That makes so much sense to a carnal mind. An eye for an eye makes sense to, to man's sense of justice. But God's sense of justice, you know, God's sense of justice is, it, you know, if, it, it, if, if, you're, if somebody does you wrong, don't forgive them seven times. Forgive them 70 times seven times. Which really mean that's really the number of, of ultimate perfection or completion. So what he was really saying was, you forgive every single time. That's God's sense of justice. God is not out to get you. And, and, and you know, really, he, he got you on the cross. So, so again, in this way, he is like the Son of God, one huge priestly presence, dominating the landscape always. You realize just how great Melchizedek is, when you see that Father Abraham gave him a tenth of the captured treasure. Priests descended from Levi are commanded by law to collect tithes from the people, even though they are all more or less equals, priests and people having a common father in Abraham. But this man, a complete outsider, collected tithes from Abraham and blessed him, the one to whom the promises had been given. In acts of blessing, the lesser is blessed by the greater. Or look at it this way, we pay our tithes to priests who die, but Abraham paid tithes to a priest who, the scripture says, lives. Ultimately, you could even say that since Levi descended from Abraham, who paid tithes to Melchizedek, when we pay tithes to the priestly tribe of Levi, they end up with Melchizedek. If the priesthood of Levi and Aaron, which provided the framework for the giving of the law, could really make people perfect, there wouldn't have been need for a new priesthood like that of Melchizedek. But since it didn't get the job done, there was a change of priesthood, which brought with it a radical new kind of law. So again, you know, if the Old Covenant was good enough, we would have needed a New Covenant. The Old Covenant was never God's be-all, end-all. The Old Covenant was given, you know, again, as a, as a schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. The Old Covenant was given so that we could understand how futile it is to try to keep the law, to try to do it in our own power, to try to 
earn self-righteousness or, or to try to earn perfection. It, it cannot be done. You know, Jesus said in another place, talking about salvation, he said, with man it is impossible, but with God all things are possible. And that's why, you know, again at the cross, that's why God became a man and died and rose again so that we could die and rise again, so that we could get out of the old and into something new, something, uh, what does it say here? Something radically new, a radical new kind of law, which again, it, it's not a law that focuses on sin and death, it's a law that focuses on life, because it's a law that focuses on Jesus. So we're not talking about being lawless. We're not talking about, oh, I can do whatever bad thing I want anymore. We're talking about a complete change of nature, a complete change of priesthood, a complete change of everything, where now I don't have to try to be anything. Now I can just be who I am as I learn more of who I am by learning more of Jesus. The more we know of Him, the more we know of ourselves. And the more we know of ourselves, the more we can be ourselves. So now let's look at 2 Corinthians chapter 3. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, starting with verse 1, and it reads in the King James, Do we begin again to commend ourselves? Or need we, as some others, epistles of commendation to you, or letters of commendation from you? Ye are our, epi our epistle written in our hearts, known and read of all men. For as much as ye are manifestly declared to be the epistle of Christ, ministered by us, written not with ink, but with the Spirit of the living God, not in tables of stone, but in fleshly tables of the heart. So again, remember last week, that's what God said the new covenant was all about. He said, I will write my laws in your minds, and I will write them on your heart. He said, no longer is it external trying to get in, but now it's internal coming out. Now we don't read epistles to figure out how to act. Now we are the epistle that God has written His laws on, His new commandment, His love. He's written it on us, not with ink, not on tables of stone, but written with the Spirit in the fleshly tables of the heart. Which again takes us back to Romans chapter 8, verse 2. It's the law of the Spirit of life. That's the new law that we live by, is the Spirit guiding us, the Spirit leading us, the Spirit bringing us into all truth. It's all about the Spirit, where, where again in the New Covenant it talks about how those who are led by the Spirit are the sons of God. Which, which again, I always, I always like to say this when, when, I, when I try to quote that verse, is that doesn't mean the Spirit's going to say, do this, do that. That means that the Spirit's going to speak of Jesus... And when we're led of that, when we understand our identity, then we can cry out, Abba, Father. Then we know that we are the Son of God. That's what the Spirit does. It, it, it speaks to our true identity. It doesn't convict us of sin, like, like the prophets of old, like the, the Mosaic Law, always just convicted you of sin and brought your sin to remembrance. But what the Spirit does is it brings your true identity to remembrance. It convicts you of righteousness. It tells you that no matter what's going on, you are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. And the more we understand who we are, the more everything we do, the, the, the more everything we do flows from that identity, flows from that knowledge and that revelation of Jesus. So so again, it's all about the spirit and it's not about, you know, the letter of the law, which which uh, again is is what we're going to see here in a couple of verses. Verse 4 says, "And such trust have we through Christ to Godward and I love that verse because it's kind of small, but it makes such a strong point to me. We have trust for all of this stuff to work through Christ to God. He is our, our rock that we are planted on. He is where we put our trust because on the cross he showed himself to be trustworthy. He, 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 he said no greater love has a man than to lay down his life for his friends. And then he put his money where his mouth was and he went to the cross and he laid his life down for us. He wasn't all talk. Everything he said, he backed up. We can trust him because we know that he is the way, the truth, and the life because he has shown us that, because he has shown himself to be trustworthy. We don't have to, uh, you know, fake it, fake it until we make it and say, okay, God, I trust you and not really trust him. We can trust him because he has shown himself to be trustworthy. So verse 5 says, Not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything as of ourselves, 
but our sufficiency is of God, which again, with man it is impossible, with God all things are possible. We trust in Him, and really when you're trusting in Him, you're not trusting in Him to do something because it is finished. You're trusting in Him that He has done something. And really, that's, that, that's the, to me, that's the best kind of trust you can have. You know, if somebody says they're going to do something and you trust them, you feel pretty good about it. But if somebody says they've already done something and you know that they've already done it, then, then it's a complete trust factor there. Then you don't have to worry about it, you don't have to think about it, you don't have to stress about it, because it's already done, it's already finished. And then in verse 6, which is where I wanted to get in this passage, 2 Corinthians 3, 6 says, Who also hath made us able ministers of the New Testament. We are not ministers of the Old Testament. We are not ministers of the Levitical priesthood. We are not ministers of the Old Covenant. We are not bringing people's sins to remembrance. We are not condemning people because of what they may or may not be doing or, or what they may or may not be believing. We are not ministers of anything old. We are able ministers of the New Testament. In another place it says it like this, God gave Jesus the word in the ministry of reconciliation, and Jesus gave us that same ministry. We are here to tell people that they have been reconciled to God. Not that they will be reconciled if they do this, this, and this. That's the Levitical priesthood. That's the law of sin and death. That's bondage. That's keeping people trapped and keeping people stuck. That's you holding the stick that the carrot's on and moving it away and telling people, well, you got to do this. you got to pray more. you got to look like this. Blah, blah, blah. That's not what we are ministers of. We are able ministers of the New Testament. And the reason that we are able ministers is because the New Testament, again, is Jesus and he lives in us. We are able to minister this because we know this, because we've experienced this, because we are living this. And again, that's what the New, New Testament is all about. It's about life. It's about Jesus' blood flowing through our veins, coming out of God's heart in our chest, pumping with love. That's how you ably minister the New Testament, is by loving people, period. Because love is what gets people, it's the goodness of God that brings men to repentance. It's not the scariness of God that brings men to repentance. So it goes on and it says, Who also hath made us able ministers of the New Testament, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter killeth, but the Spirit giveth life. And this is where we're, this, we're going to look at this, uh, this compare and contrast for, for the, the last part of the sermon tonight. We're going to see that when the law was given, men died. And when the Spirit was given, men lived. So, so again, the, the letter killeth, but the Spirit giveth life. That's the main difference between the two covenants. The old covenant was all about what you're doing wrong with no power to help you do anything right. And the new covenant... Jesus is all about what you what what your identity is as the Son of God, not not as what you're doing, but as who you are. So in the Message Bible, 2 Corinthians 3, starting with verse 1, reads like this. It says, Does it sound like we're patting ourselves on the back, insisting on our credentials, asserting our authority? Well, we're not. Neither do we need letters of endorsement, either to you or from you. You yourselves are all the endorsement we need. Your very lives are a letter that anyone can read by just looking at you. Christ himself wrote it, not with ink, but with God's living spirit, not chiseled into stone, but carved into human lives, and we publish it. Think about that for a minute. You are the letter that Christ wrote. You are God's love letter to the world. You are God saying, I love this much, that I'm going to lay down my life for you, and I'm going to pick it back up so you can have my life. I'm going to give my life for you, and I'm going to give my life to you, and then I'm going to live my life through you. You are, again, you are God's love letter to the world. You are how he expresses how much he loves humanity. You are his, his, his vessel of love on this earth. You are his lighthouse to shine the light wherever you're at, to shine the love wherever you're at. That's how we are able ministers of this New Testament. That's how we truly minister, by loving one another with the same love that we have received. By, again, it says, by publishing the letter that Jesus wrote in our hearts. So it goes on and it says, 
We couldn't be more sure of ourselves in this, that you, written by Christ himself for God, are our letter of recommendation. We wouldn't think of writing this kind of letter about ourselves. Only God can write such a letter. His letter authorizes us to help carry out this new plan of action. The plan wasn't written out with ink on paper, with pages and pages of legal footnotes, killing your spirit. It's written with spirit on spirit, his life on our lives. And it's interesting here because it's, when it says it's written with spirit on spirit, it's written with spirit, capital S, the Holy Spirit, on spirit, little s, us. Because again, you know, remember way, way back in the beginning when God breathed the breath of life into Adam's nostrils, Adam became a living soul. But then when Jesus breathed uh, uh, the, the, the Holy Spirit on, onto his disciples, on all of us, when, when, when God's Spirit covered all flesh, then we became living spirits. There was a shift, there was a change. We're no longer that old man, we're no longer that Levitical priesthood, we're no longer tied to, to that law of sin and death. We've been freed from it. Which, which again is what Romans 8 verse 2 says, and this time I want to read it in the Amplified Bible. It reads, For the law of the Spirit of life, which is in Christ Jesus, the law of our new being, has freed me from the law of sin and death. I'm free from the law of sin and death quite simply because I died 2,000 years ago on the cross. And now, because I died and I'm no longer connected to that law because I'm freed from that law, now there's a new law, the, 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 the law of the spirit of life, which is in Christ Jesus, which is the law of our new being. Our new being is Christ Jesus in us. That's who we are now. That's not what we do. That's not what we try to do. That's not who we try to be. That's who we are in him because he's in us. And that's how we were freed from the law of sin and death. He became sin and died and freed us from sin. He gave us something to believe in and freed us from unbelief. So, so again, there's the difference, there's the contrast, and, and again, that's how it happened. It happened on the cross. So now let's look at the law, the letter killing, and, and the spirit giving life. So go to Exodus chapter 32 and... I wanted to read a lot of this, but I'm cutting it down for time's sake. I'm going to read verses 26 through 28. But the backstory here is Moses goes up on the mountain to get the law, and he's up there for you know 40 days and 40 nights, and the people start getting restless, and they come to Aaron and they say, you know, we don't know what happened to Moses. We need you to make us a god. And Aaron said, give me your gold, and I'll make you a golden calf. And 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 they're all having a big party and they're dancing and they're whooping it up and they're worshiping this false idol. And, and, and they've turned their backs, you know, as soon as, as soon as pastor's out of the room, they started acting like a bunch of heathens. And, and, and verse 26 picks it up in Exodus 32, and it says, Then Moses stood in the gate of the camp, and said, Who is on the Lord's side? Let him come unto me. And all the sons of Levi gathered themselves together unto him. So we see, as soon as the law was given, Levi was right there on board with it. We see the priesthood of Levi totally and completely connected to the law of Moses, to the law of sin and death. And verse 27 says, And he, Moses, said unto them, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Put every man his sword by his side, and go in and out from gate to gate throughout the camp, and slay every man his brother, and every man his companion, and every man his neighbor. And the children of Levi did according to the word of Moses. And there fell of the people that day about three thousand men. So as soon as the law was given, the people started acting basically like, like idiots. The people started. The people rebelled before, really before they had anything to rebel against. Just because e even though you know, the, even though the law makes sense to the carnal mind, what also makes sense to the carnal mind is give me a rule and I'll break it. The carnal mind is at enmity with God. It's not subject to the law of God. Neither can it be. There's something inside of us that says, if you tell me what to do, I want to do the the opposite thing. You know, you know that whole whole rebel without a cause, man-centered, selfish beast nature. That's where that's where we were at this time when the law was given. And, and really, you know, it, it, from from man's point of view, if that's how I am, then I need something telling me how to be. Even though I'm going to rebel against it, that's the best I can come up with. 
And that's why God gave them that law, to show them that that way does not work. Behavior modification does not work. An external law telling you what to do does not work. And again, we see that 3,000 people died. As soon as the Levitical priesthood, as soon as the law got involved, all it could do was point out sinners and take care of sinners. That's what the law is good at. That's the only thing that it can accomplish. Because again, you know, it demands perfection, but, but it can't do anything to produce perfection. In a sense, it demands perfection from an imperfect people, and that's never going to work. So then we fast forward to Acts chapter 2. And we're going to read verses 36 through 41. Acts chapter 2, starting with verse 36, says, Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus, whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. So now we're talking about the cross and the effects of the cross. Now we're talking about the new covenant. Now we're talking about not, not an external covenant trying to change people, but we're talking about a covenant God who has changed people, who has conformed us to His image, who has transformed us, who has brought us out of bondage and freed us from sin and death. Now we're talking about God raising up His Son and making Him, again it says, both Lord and Christ. So verse 37 says, Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart, and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? They started preaching about Jesus. Men saw the goodness of God. Men, you know, repented or, or changed their minds or their mindsets. But they didn't know what to do. They said, okay, what do we do? What do we do now? Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. And ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. And, and, you know, again, I think there's a difference between God giving us the Holy Ghost. I believe he did that to everybody, for everybody, when, when, when Jesus, you know, when Jesus ascended and the Holy Spirit descended. There's a difference between him giving us the Holy Ghost and us receiving the Holy Ghost. So, so again, you know, I'm not saying there's hoops to jump through here. I'm not saying there's a formula to get the Holy Ghost. I'm, I'm saying being baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, totally and completely identifying with him, that's how, that, that's how we apprehend what we've been apprehended of, uh, I guess you could say. So, so he immediately starts, he immediately brings it to the Holy Ghost. He doesn't say, you've got to follow this law and this law and this law. He didn't say you have to be circumcised. He didn't say, you, you know, you have to follow the Ten Commandments. He said, repent, be baptized in the name of Jesus, and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promise is unto you, and to your children, and to all that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. And with many other words did he testify and exhort. How do we ably minister the New Testament? By testifying and exhorting. By loving people. By building them up. By telling them who they really are. By telling them who Jesus really is. By showing them that God is not mad at you, but he's mad about you. By showing them that Daddy loves you so much that he would literally rather die than be without you. And, and, you know, again, he was always with us. What he really died for was, was he didn't want us to be without him. So that's what he did. He said, uh, it says, And with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward generation. And, and I feel like that call to save yourselves from this untoward generation is the same thing that Paul spoke about when he said, Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. It was not a call to, to necessarily to, to get out of the world, because that's what Jesus did for us and as us. He brought us out of the world. I think what he's saying is, you know, don't go back. Don't, don't conform to the world when you've already been conformed to the image of the Son of God. Don't, don't, don't go back to an untoward generation, but, but keep yourself toward the Lord, so to speak. <coughs> and then verse 41, it says, Then they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. So again, we, we, what we saw with the Levitical priesthood, with the law of sin and death, was when the law was given, 3,000 men died. But when the Holy Spirit was given, 3,000 men came to life, so to speak, 
when they were baptized, when they received this gift with gladness, when, 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 when what was available to them was presented to them and they could lay a hold of it. When they could say, this, this, this is too good to be true, but I want it. And, and, and you know, the, the Spirit and the Bride say, come. It doesn't say, you know, it doesn't say the Spirit and the Bride say, come or else. The Spirit and the Bride say, come, because what they have is so good that they want to share it. Come and get it. Jesus said, take my yoke upon you. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Jesus said, there's a more excellent way. There's a better way to do this. There's a better covenant. There's a better high priest. You don't have to suffer and struggle and fight for everything you have. You just simply need to understand who your daddy is. And then you can just simply receive from him. Then you can enter into rest and you can stop trying to finish a work that has already been finished. A work that really was finished from the foundation of the world when the lamb was slain from the foundation of the world. Every qualification you would ever need to meet in your life was met in Jesus on the cross. And because of what he did, listen, Jesus did it all so we could get it all. And the all that he did was he died for us and he rose again, you know, for us and as us. And the all that we got was him. It's love. It's a relationship. It, it, it's not a letter that kills, but it's a spirit that gives life. So again, we see an, an almost direct parallel where, again, when the law was given, 3,000 died. When the Spirit was given, 3,000 were added. So let me read it in the Message Bible. And then I want to read Romans chapter 8, verse 2 one more time. And, and I love the way, in the Weymouth translation, that it puts this. But Acts chapter 2, starting in verse, right around verse 36, it says... All Israel then know this. There's no longer room for doubt. God made him Master and Messiah, this Jesus whom you killed on a cross. Cut to the quick, those who were there listening asked Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, brothers, so now what do we do? And you know, again, I think, that, I think that's a pretty natural response when you're presented something this glorious, something this good, to say, Jesus who died on the cross has was raised again. Jesus who was dead is now alive. The The problems that you had, the, the separation that we created in our minds between us and God has been dealt with and taken away. The stone has been rolled away. The, the veil has been rent from top to bottom. Okay, what do we do now? And then Peter said, change your life. Turn to God and be baptized, each of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, so your sins are forgiven. Receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is targeted to you and your children, but also to all who are far away, whomever, in fact, our Master God invites. He went on in this vein for a long time, urging them over and over, Get out while you can. Get out of this sick and stupid culture. Which I like that because it almost brings it back to, to again, the original covenant, to God saying, I'm, I'm taking care of the wickedness of this world. I'm going to wash it clean. Get in the ark. I think, again, you know... Uh, I, I, I can't land on exactly where it is, but it talks about how God never gives us a temptation without a way of escape. And the way of escape is Jesus. Whatever you're dealing with, He has already overcome it so that we might be more than overcomers, so that we might be more than conquerors through Him that loves us. So again, it's not, you know, it's not about getting away from people. It's about getting away from, from the, the, this, again, as it says, this sick and stupid culture, this untoward generation. It's about being in the world, but not of the world, so to speak, which really just simply means that, that you're in the kingdom because the kingdom's in you. So again, it's not saying flee from the dark. It's saying, you know, let your light shine among men, and then the darkness will flee from you. And it says, that day about 3,000 took him at his word, trust, faith, just simply faith comes from hearing and hearing from the word. That day about 3,000 took him at his word, were baptized, and were signed up. So let me finish with Romans chapter 8 verse 2 in the Weymouth translation. It says, For the Spirit's law, telling of life in Jesus Christ, has set me free from the law that deals only with sin and death. So again, what we see here is the Holy Spirit 
leading and guiding us into all truth by testifying about Jesus, the Holy Spirit, telling us over and over again, Daddy loves you. The Holy Spirit, from the inside out, revealing to us who we really are, that has set me free from the law that deals only with sin and death. And if I've been set free from the law that deals only with sin and death, that means I don't have to deal with sin and death. That means I don't have to be on a sin hunt. That means I don't have to try to conquer sin. I don't have to try to, you know, drive sin out of the camp. Jesus, the scapegoat, the, the sins of the world were put on him, and he took them out of the camp. He took away the sin of the world. He did all of this stuff that we're still so focused on trying to do. And if we can stop focusing on all of that, and we can just simply listen to what the Spirit is speaking, which again it says, for the Spirit's law, telling of life in Jesus Christ has set me free. So, so what is the new law? What is the perfect law of liberty? It's simply Jesus. He is our liberty. You know, the Bible says in another place, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. So if His Spirit lives in us, that means there's liberty in us. That means I don't have to go anywhere or do anything to be free. That means I am free. He has freed me. He has made me free. He, and, and listen, whom the Son sets free, whom the Son makes free, is free indeed. And, and I take, I've always taken that two ways where, where that means indeed we are free. And it also means I'm free indeed. I'm free in action. My actions no longer flow from me trying to get something. I'm free from all of that. My actions now flow from what I have. My actions now flow from who I am. I'm not trying to get something I think I don't have. I'm simply sharing what I know I do have. I'm simply, now Now again, I'm an able minister of the New Testament. Now I'm not killing people because of what they're doing, but instead I'm giving people life because of what I have. If you can't give what you don't have and you can only give what you do have, we have to understand that we have life. We are life. We have love. We are love. So that's what we can give. That's what we can minister. Again, you know, the word of reconciliation. Not get reconciled or else, but we have been reconciled. Jesus finished the work. Jesus did what was necessary to free us from the bondage that we were in. And now we're not servants anymore. We're not slaves anymore. Now we know that we are God's beloved Son, in whom He is well pleased. And everything we get from Daddy is a gift. And when we receive it, when we stop trying, when we stop robbing ourselves by trying to earn it, but when we just receive it from a posture of rest, when we stop trying to overcome, and we understand that we have overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony, when we stop trying to conquer and we understand that we are more than conquerors because Jesus already conquered, when we understand that this new covenant is not about what you do, it's not about sin and death, it's not about, you know, and, and again, if it's not about sin and death, that means it's not about not sinning, and it's not about not dying. Those aren't the concerns either. The concern is simply spending our lives in relationship with our Father. I'm not worried about sin, and I'm not worried about whether I'm sinning or whether I'm not sinning, because Jesus handled the sin issue. He took away the sin of the world. He took away unbelief. He took away, and, and, and again, He took away unbelief by giving us something to believe in, by giving us Himself. That's where our trust comes from. It comes from a God who has shown Himself trustworthy. That's where our faith comes from. It comes from a God who has shown Himself faithful. That's where our love comes from. It comes from a God who has shown His love to us. Everything we have and everything we are comes from who He is. You know, in the same way, because we partake of His divine nature. Because as He is, so are we in this world. So this new covenant, it's not about us and about what we're doing. It's about Jesus and who He is in us. And, and, and again, that's the difference between the two covenants. The old covenant was about sin and death. You're a sinner, you got to die. You, you know, excusing, and I'm not going to get into this, but... But we think that's what the Old Covenant was about, but even still, God had made a whole system of sacrifice in order that, that we might not die, which again was, was culminated in Jesus, who, who if we believe on Him, we shall not perish, but have everlasting life. But again, it's, it, it's the focus. What are, if you're focused on sin and death, you're focused on the wrong covenant. If you define sin according to the law of Moses, you're in the wrong covenant. If, 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 if all that stuff is dragging you down, you're in the wrong covenant. But... If it's about the Spirit's law, telling of life in Christ Jesus, 
if you're free, if there's liberty, if there's rest, if there's love, if there's life, then that's when you know, then you're in the new covenant. You're in the promised land. You are where you need to be, not because you got there, but because Jesus brought you there. So that's what I have for this week. Uh, I love you guys. Thank you. Uh, amen.